Well, I, I'm, um, my background originally is physics and electrical engineering. Um, I um, studied at Monash University in Australia. Um, I did a master's degree doing um, uh, VLSI, so very large scale integrated circuit electronic design. Um, and at, at some point when I was doing that, got interested in neuroscience. I sat in on, on the medical um, school neuroscience uh, lectures and decided to sort of switch track and do a PhD in computational neuroscience. So I then uh, went over to Oxford to do a computational neuroscience PhD, was heavily involved in sort of developing algorithms for neurophysiological data analysis then. And I took up uh, experiments as a postdoc. Um, and uh, two photon imaging. So first postdoc with, was with Tony Movshon at NYU and a second postdoc with Michael Heuser, uh, where I, I um, took up the two photon imaging work. Um, and then when I set my own lab up, I sort of you know, brought all these things together, but uh, um, certainly sort of op optical imaging approaches to, to studying the brain have been a, a key aspect of um, research in my group uh, over, over the years. Um, the, what you can see, um, uh, on the slide in front of you is the Royal School of Mines building. Um, it's M-I-N-E-S, not M-I-N-D-S. Unfortunately, I've been tempted to, to, to face it, uh, to <laughs> correct that. Uh, um, and uh, actually my lab is sort of, um, oh, if you, you can see my cursor there, it's sort of somewhere through there about sort of 50 meters in. Uh, the front of this building is sort of grade two listed. So we, we can't have the labs on the front side, but uh, so the, la the labs are all in the building behind basically. My office is sort of up, off up to the left, uh, left there. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be talking about um, um, about behavior. Okay, so how how to do um, how to do behavior while doing two photon imaging, or how to do two photon imaging while doing behavior. Either way you look at it. Um, and uh, I've used the word floating head fixed mice. You you they're not swimming. You'll know what I, I mean when I talk about that, that in a minute. But um, um yeah just a brief sort of um intro to my lab so it it's at the, well, the the name has changed over the years it's now called the neural coding and neurodegenerative disease lab our aims are to understand how information is represented stored retrieved and processed in the central nervous system uh, and then there's a um a translational aspect as well to sort of to use that in development of therapeutics um um, to treat neurodegenerative disorders, um, um, in particular Alzheimer's disease. So we've um, we've sort of had had funding starting about seven years ago to, to start a project on that. Um, and um, sort of you know almost Im implicit here um, in this audience is, um, and actually a key focus of the lab is to develop the technology that we need to achieve those goals. Basically, so um, you know we. Um, we don't reinvent the wheel if it's already there, but if if we need to um, to do something new in order to ask uh, some of these questions, and we we sort of take that on as a challenge, as as do um, you know pretty much everyone else uh, uh, speaking in this audience. Um, and the work I'm going to talk about today mostly comes out of a project which was aimed at. Um, or developing and, and validating a platform for studying changes to neural circuits underpinning memory. Um, so we wanted to measure neural population activity in awake mice performing a spatial memory task to separate out contributions to different aspects of memory, to memory encoding, to memory recall, um, and then also to be able to look at sort of different uh, types of memory, sort of you know, longer term memory um, versus sort of, you know, sort of short term working memory over over sort of the tens of second uh, um, time scale that, that might be needed during a particular behavioral task. Um, then to, to be use this platform um, to um, test mouse models of Alzheimer's disease um, and to characterize um, how um, you know, various sort of therapeutic um, rescue approaches um, um, work and in particular sort of how, how they rescue not just behavior but circuit properties uh, in the brain. And a key aspect of this was not just to be able to do, um, you know, to ask the mouse, you know, um, you know how it did, you know, you know, uh, you know how, how it remembers something, but to be able to directly read out um, um, performance from, from the brain as well. Because I mean, mice, um, I love mice, but they're a bit stupid. So uh, some sometimes it's you can get a lot more information by by you know really just sort of reading out from network activity. Um, so just a few slides on the motivation here. Um, 
So, you know, why am I interested in Alzheimer's disease? Um, um, well, it's, you know, um, you know, dementia in general is now in the UK, it's the leading cause of death, um, excluding COVID-19. I'm not sure if that's true in the US um, yet. Um, I guess it will be at one point if you have a um, institute gun control anyway. Um, uh, it's got greater economic, economic impact than cancer and heart disease combined. Um, a quarter of all hospital beds are actually occupied by people living with dementia. And Alzheimer's disease that we're looking at is the most common form of dementia. Um, now, we were our approach to this was particularly motivated by um, some papers from uh, Mark Arul Bush, um, who's, who's now at the um, Dementia Research Institute in London. Um, uh, and he did this, this work when he was in Arthur Conneth's group in Germany. Um, um, and this was using two photon microscopy to investigate the phenomenon, phenomenon known as aberrant excitability, which had, had come out of you know, a few sort of previous work, um, you know, previous pieces of work using a few different technological approaches. Um, and um, this is sort of really summarizes it um, fairly well here. So um, yeah, this is using a, a, a slightly older approach approach. Um, um, those of us who are a bit long in the tooth remember AMS to dies. Um, where before we had G-camps, we had to um, inject, inject um, membrane permeable dyes into the brain, um, perform some sort of uh, uh, voodoo rituals. And if we were lucky, um, we'd get some nice sort of stained um, stained neurons and some and some background neural pill around it. So, so they use this method and um, um, so here you can see um, a wild type mouse. Um, we're looking at five neurons there and you can see the calcium transients sort of corresponding to, um, to normal activity going on here. Now, uh, they've also done this in an, oops, so in an amyloid um, model. So it's uh, the um, APP23 cross PS45, presenolin 45 model. So it's a sort of, um, um, it's a double, um, transgenic uh, Alzheimer model here. Um, and there are two things you can see. You can see in blue here, you can see some, some cells um, which you know, become silent, okay? So, so they're hypo-excitable. Then in red, you can see other cells which become hyper-excitable. So you have hyperactivity. And it's, there's two things happening here, perhaps. You know, one is, um, just a general increase in the firing rate, but note that also, of course, you can, if you have a change in the pattern of firing, you might have um, you know, a, a burst of spikes being fired together, which might result in one big uh, calcium transient like here, um, and then you know, potentially a silent period in between them. Um, so um, so we, you know, we're gonna to want to look at not just the rate of calcium transients that are being fired, um, but also at, um, at you know, changes in the amplitude of them. Um, and you know the overall amount of activity there. Um, okay, so um, it turned out that um, yeah, you 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 see in you see both hyperactive and um, silent cells, and there is some dependence upon proximity to plaques. So you can see here um, that um, hyperactive cells tend to be. Um, reasonably close to plaque. So these are these um, in blue here, we can see thioflavin labeled um, amyloid uh, beta plaques. Um, and we can see, so in, in red, in this uh, bar chart here, um, up within 60 microns of those plaques, you're getting sort of hyperactive cells. Um, there are also um, silent cells, um, and these are sort of throughout, including some nearby, but also some further away. So both of these both of these phenomena are sort of going on here. So there's some potentially quite complex and quite interesting things um, sort of happening in, in these mouse models. This, this general effect is not just true in this particular mouse model of Alzheimer's, but we've, well, we've as we'll see in a minute, we've seen it in, um, in other mouse models as well. Um, and it, um, well, phenomena that presumably relate to this have been seen with, um, 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 you know, PET and uh, fMRI uh, studies in human patients as well. So this um, suggests to us actually that, you know, we really want to be looking at, um, you, know, you know, looking at the circuitry going on here. Now, this was done in um, 
in this particular experiment was done in an anesthetized mouse. This is this is in cortex. Um, you know, similar things have been done in hippocampus, but it hadn't been done in um, you know in an animal performing a cognitive task. And one of the things we really wanted to know is, well, actually, how does this affect memory performance? Um, you know, we know that there are disturbances in the mouse's behavior while it's performing a memory task. So how do these changes in the in the circuit activity relate to that? So that's what, what we want to look at. Um, so to do that, um, you know, we need to do some behavior. So what we're going to be looking at is imaging hippocampal subfield CA1 um, during cognitive tasks. So why CA1? Um, you know, basically, you know, because you find place cells there, there's a lot of sort of uh, literature on involvement of place cells in, um, and particularly in spatial memory tasks. Um, um, so it's a sort of, uh, it's a good place to start. It's a sort of a well mapped out area. Um, now, what I'm going to show you, I'll, I'll just sort of uh, give a prelude to it and then I'll go through some of the, the sort of the alternative approaches. Um, um, but what, what we're doing um, is two tasks. And the first one is a very simple one. Um, we simply have the mice run around a, cir a circular track. Now you may be familiar with um, some of the um, place cell papers where they have you know, mice or rats um, run up and back a linear track. So our version of that is it's similar, but we actually have a circular track so that they can run you know, repeatedly around it. And then you know, at the end of it, they get to the start of the next lap and they can just keep, keep running um, around that. And that lets us sort of acquire um, you know, large numbers of trials um, in, a, in an imaging session. So it's quite useful. Uh, now you might say, well, this isn't much of a cognitive task. Hey, how is this a cognitive task? The, the, the mouse is just running around. Okay. Um, so um, there are several, several ways in which it's a, a cognitive task. Now, firstly, um, um, the, the, um, the place cells, so the hippocampal CA1 cells, some good fraction of them are place cells. Um, we can use those to read out basically, a you know, um, a spatial memory. So, um, uh, you know, the, the activity of the place cells will allow the mouse to know where it is in the environment. Um, um, that's a sort of a readout of spatial memory. Um, we'll see later how we can actually then set up, you know, the mouse going in between different environments to sort of set up encoding and recall um, scenarios, etc. So we can actually, it's actually surprisingly um, um, a useful sort of um, a framework to, to actually ask some of these questions. Um, and in particular, it, you know, this approach lets us get a lot, a lot of samples. And so that's actually very useful for the quantitative measures we want to use. Um, now, at that point, though, we're not able to, you know, we're not asking the mouse, um, you know, what it remembers. Um, we're just, we're asking the mouse's brain, but not the mouse itself. So what we've added to that is a spatial working memory task where we can do all of the place cell mapping, etc. Um, but we can also, um, you know, you know, get the mouse to, um, uh, to perform the task, measure the performance on that task and, and see how well that remembers. And then to be able to control that task dif difficulty. Um, via, del via a delay period, which we're not actually doing at the moment. At the moment we've got a fixed delay period, but we can, you know, that's something that, that we are adding. Um, and both of these tasks, um, you know, from the literature, it's known the performance in, well, in things similar to them is degraded in uh, Alzheimer um, mouse models. So, okay, to look at this, you know, we've got a number of technological sort of options. Um, you know, we could, for instance, go with, um, you know, neuropixels type arrays, high density multi-electrode arrays. Um, and, uh, you know, that, that is a good option in many ways. Um, it um, has got, you know, some nice features, particularly now that the sort of technology for this has really sort of scaled up, um, that you can have many of these in the brain at once. You can record from different brain areas simultaneously. You can have them in deep brain areas. You can simultaneously record from, say, hippocampus and cortical areas. So some of those things where we're maybe not quite at the point of doing with imaging, although we're getting there. Um, so this this has some advantages, and there are there are groups doing that. Um, so we you know, we chose not to focus on that. Um, the main drawback um, here, of course, is cell localization. You can do it to some extent, um, but um, you know, but you don't on a on a sort of a microcircuit scale. It's sort of hard to you know hard to know um, exactly exactly where the cells are. Um, Going to imaging, um, the miniscope technology has come along a lot in recent years. Um, um, and again, you know, this has, you know, this is now you know, very much a competitive technology. Um, um, if we were starting over, we, we might well do that. In fact, we may, we may do it in the future. A, 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 a particular advantage of being able to have 
um, relatively small um, sort of uh, uh, lenses implanted. Um, typically, the systems out there use one millimeter diameter lenses, um, but there is recent work um, with 500 micron uh, diameter green lenses, um, which together with um, 3D printed optical um, correction uh, cuffs, so you can basically um, do effectively adaptive, a fixed adaptive, adaptive optics. So it's not really adaptive, but a, a fixed correction. Um, uh, to compensate for aberrations and use the full 500 microns. And that 500 microns is not so big, right? So, so that can be sort of inserted without doing too much damage, um, you know, to get to deep brain areas. Um, it's got the catch that a bit like electrophysiology, you know, you're doing something equivalent to spike sorting because you don't get um, uh, depth um, um, uh, separation of neuro view, multiple neurons, you know, in, in depth, if they were firing always at the same time, for instance, you'd have difficulty distinguishing between them. Um, and so the, the source separation approaches, you know, make some assumptions in doing that, but nevertheless, they're able to um, you know, you know, pull out, um, you know, subject to some assumptions um, in many neurons these days. So that's actually quite a, a powerful approach. Now, most of us here love um, multi-photon imaging. Um, at the moment, it really gives us sort of the, you know, the best imaging, um, oops. It's supposed to it's supposed to play um, the best um, you know the best optical access to the brain in in a way um, we get um, uh, you know very fine Z resolution as well as X Y resolution um, and you know we really know where our, our signals are coming from so the approach we've taken is to um, is to try and use this the catch is it requires head fixation okay and um, that that has issues for behavior as as might be obvious so how, how do we deal with that um so there are sort of several ways to deal with it and i'll start with so the one on the left here is the approach that's been taken by the international brain laboratory um sort of big consortium um and you know they've got this sort of standard at the moment it's a um it's one task they all do one task okay they've standardized on this one task but it could be adapted to sort of related tasks sort of fairly easily um and it's um you know you can see there's a the you know camera for eye tracking there's sort of you know speaker there's a visual display screen um so you can have multimodal stimuli um the mouse is sort of head fixed in this apparatus here um, and you know, you can do um, electrophysiology or, or uh, multi-photon imaging using this approach. So um, this is useful in, in particular for get, collecting very large numbers of trials um, of well-controlled to alternative force choice type psychophysics tasks. The task um, that, they've, um, that they've used is a perceptual decision uh, task. Um, you may sort of say, well, it's not a particularly natural behavior. Now, obviously it's a useful behavior to characterize, um, but um, it's not, you know, in itself, in, in, in the, uh, you know, particularly within the, um, the repertoire of the natural behavior of a, of a mouse. Um, now, looking at cognitive tasks, the history of cognitive tasks has been very different, and they have typically looked something more like this. So this, you know, you, you may recognize um, uh, the one on the top is the famous Morris water maze. Um, so, you know, that's got a number of features which are perhaps inconvenient for, for two photon imaging. I mean, one of which is that you've got this massive water bath, but then you know, the animal sort of moving around and you know, you've got the barns maze and, and, um, on a more simple level, sort of a simple sort of Y maze um, used for alternation tasks as well. So in, in common with all of these, and in common with really the development of the, of the you know, cognitive, um, the, the rodent cognitive neuroscience literature has been freely moving behavior, okay? So um, the down, there are you know, several downsides of freely moving behavior, I would say. One is, which is actually, it's, it can be quite hard to control um, specific um, aspects of tasks so that, um, you know, you maybe want to repeatedly sample some aspect, but actually, you know, each, each sample things are a bit different because the animal can be in you know, many different configurations. So it can be hard to control things. Um, obviously there's a head fixation aspect as well. Um, these typically have relatively small numbers of trials, sort of tens of trials. You often have a, um, 
you know, you you need a person in many of these cases, you know, to you know to be you know lifting the animal out and putting it back in, etc. Um, so they're not really geared up to large numbers of trials, which is what we need to do quantitative studies. So we were looking at well, how you know, can we have the best of both worlds? You know, can we try and draw on this massive literature in you know cognitive uh, neuroscience um, while having head fixed animals? Um, and we got talking with um, Leo Karug in Finland, who'd set up a, a small company um, called Neurotar um, um, that started making up a, a, a platform. Now, this had, these things had all come out of, you know, we and others had been doing um, virtual reality tasks where you have a sort of a spherical ball, which is um, on your, you know, floating on air jets and the mouse runs on that. And again, you can um, you know, use that to... Um, you know, track position and um, feed that into a computer game-like system so the animal can explore a virtual environment. Um, and we were looking at, well, actually, you know, can, can we take the same approach and use it for a, a real persistent environment, a multimodal environment? And this is actually the approach that Leo came up with. Um, basically, you have, a, um, you have an air, some air jets um, you know, coming up through a hole and a flat platform. Um, the animal's head fixed. The animal moves on, on the platform. Um, but it's actually the animal stays in one place. It's the platform that moves. And the animals actually quite quickly learn to navigate around this. There were a few optimizations that had to be done. I mean, the very early versions of this that we tried um, basically were too freely moving. I mean, um, it was, uh, it was you know, a little unstable. The animals would tend to run, you know, run around in a slightly unstable way. The neat advance actually was putting magnets on the, so this is a carbon fiber cage. The weight of it has to be balanced exactly right, of course. Um, but then putting a couple of magnets on the bottom. Now, the bit under, underneath here is aluminium. Um, okay, so it's not ferromagnetic, but basically as the magnets move across it, it induces eddy currents and there's a sort of retarding force. So that actually makes the, the um, kinematics of the movement um, slightly more re realistic. It's not exactly corresponding to sort of, you know, real world kinematics, obviously, but it, um, it makes the task sort of much more, more learnable. And then, you know, you've got the platform here and the microscope just sort of sitting above it. And we have a little sort of, um, you know, periscope sort of platform there just to, um, to make it all fit. Um, this is what it looks like in practice. This is just from the Neurotar um, website. So you can see the, all the little holes there, the other little holes with um, you know, air jets come out of. There's a, this is a typical carbon fiber cage, a sort of open field. Um, the, the mice um, will sort of come in through this particular um, sort of sidewall to be um, taken in and out. And they can move in and out of different um, such cages during a behavioral session. Um, it's got track it. So this um, device um, here, so it basically allows it to track. Um, so you can track the position um, of, of the cage exactly during the experiment. And, and, and we have that set up to be monitored online so we can then use that to for instance sort of open solenoids when the mouse enters a particular region and things like that um, okay so that's the apparatus we're using um, so um, what do what have we been doing with it um, so we're imaging neural activity during a memory task as i mentioned um, this um, actually a slightly old slide this is um, uh, based on GCAMP 6, um, for a couple of years, we switched over to JGCAMP 7. Um, um, in the early days, we had this nice um, GCAMP 6 M Ruby um, dual expression virus. So basically it labeled the same cells very nicely with both a red um, indicator, which let us look at um, just a structural image, doesn't change over time, and a green one, which is an act, you know, which is our activity sensor, which does change over time. It's nice to have a red, this this red unchanging one because it improves our ability to do you know movement correction, etc. Um, because the green channel obviously is changing, not just because of you know you might have um, you know some um, you know structural movement there, but actually the baseline is quite low, and on any given at any given time point, different neurons may be active. Um, so it helps to have um, something else there. Now what we do is we actually do a viral cocktail and that's not quite as good because it doesn't necessarily label in exactly, um, you know, exactly the same sort of sets of neurons. Um, so, okay, what we do is we do a, um, we aspirate a small uh, a three millimeter diameter um, window. This is not to scale um, over um, hippocampus. Um, and, uh, we stop at the corpus callosum and then we image um, down to CA1 in hippocampus um, there. Um, 
when we're doing this, we do this at the same. So we're doing this in both wild type mice and in the 5XFAD um, uh, model of Alzheimer's disease, which I'll be talking about in more detail a bit later on. Um, and you know, those mice develop amyloid plaques at a relatively um, uh, you know, young age, sort of two to four months. Um, um, we use methoxy XO4, um, um, which is an IP injectable um, dye, um, which labels the plaques um, and you know, it lasts for sort of a, you know, you know, multiple days. So we can do that. We, in, we inject it. Um, we're imaging at um, 940 nanometers um, for our calcium imaging, but we go down to um, 720 to image the, um, the methoxy. And we basically map, we map the, the labeled area of cortex, including in 3D, the locations of the, of the amyloid plaques, which we can then sort of bring back and use in analysis. Um, and just to mention, there's a, a group, group of people involved. I'll give um, a slide at the end with, with everybody. Um, this is um, Anne Go, um, who's a basic a senior postdoc now, who's been sort of running this project in my group all the way through. Um, Jake Rogers was a, a postdoc um, a, a visiting from Uni of Melbourne, um, who helped us get a lot of the behavior going. Um, Katie Davey um, is now a lecturer at Uni of Melbourne, who helped us get, get um, some of the analysis going. And Siegfried Prado is a, a PhD student who's been working on this. Um, okay, so, um, so this is what it looks like um, during you know, doing the behavior. And we can have different tasks running. At the one we typically do is this circular track. Um, the circumference of the track is 100 centimeters, which happens to correspond almost exactly to, to the same lengths they use in the linear track experiments as well. Um, but we can have other variants as well. And we've, we've sort of tried various, various uh, other experiments. And you can see the mouse sort of run, you know, running um, with the objective lens there. Um, 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 you know, while we're performing some Im imaging there. Okay, so um, how does this work? So we, we typically train the animals for um, about a week, okay? It takes them about a week to learn this. Um, we do two sessions per day um, uh, during the normal training phase, uh, behavioral training phase. Um, so after, after 14 sessions, there is, is a week of, um, of training. Um, they learn the circular track more easily than when they learn the open field. So this is an, a, this is an open field environment. Um, um, one thing you can see is that in the open field environment, there's a slightly longer tailed speed distribution. Um, and compared to, we've compared it with, um, um, I wouldn't say freely behaving, freely moving, but tethered, because of course most of the experiments done uh, by the tetroid people, etc., are tethered um, experiments, and um, our speed distribution is slightly longer tail than than the tethered the tethered ones, basically. Um, so it's not completely realistic, but it's fairly good, and you can see we're exploring the environment quite nicely. Um, that was like in our early experiments, what we would tend to find is mice might sort of sort of run around the edge and not really explore in the middle there. And you know, after we sort of optimize things, we got it going. Um, um, we give them rewards at a so so the, the mice are water restricted the way we do it, and we give them rewards um, at a, a random location. Um, uh, we have tried doing it without water restriction, and they can do it, but they take longer to learn it and they run less you know, for less of the session. So we get less good data, basically. Um, uh, also, if you always do um, the reward delivery at the same location, we found that we then end up with a lot of place cells at that reward location, which we didn't want. Um, so we, we do a randomized reward location. And so they, they learn both of these over the course of a week or so. Um, circular track slightly faster. Um, so now there's several issues here, which are, um, you know, things to discuss. Um, so now one is in comparison to standard sort of hippocampal, um, you know, place field tasks. Um, the normal scenario then there is that you have the visual cues on the wall. Okay. You might, you know, they do things like they might take the whole maze and rotate it around or, or switch the cues for other cues, etc. sort of on the wall. So that distal cues. Um, in our case, they're actually proximal cues. They're fairly close. Um, and the reason is we're doing this, um, 
you know, in the two photo microscope, um, um, we've got, um, and, and this, and this um, cage is um, you know, moving around, well, it, it's basically moving around relative to where the mouse is. Um, anything that's on the walls of the, um, of our Faraday cage, the two photo microscope would be a confound, right? So we can't use that distal Q approach. Um, so what we've done instead, um, you know, the other thing we, you know, it might've been nice to be able to put some, um, you know, LCD displays, et cetera, on the side, but they're too heavy. Um, what we did instead is we've put um, phosphorescent tape. Okay, it's uh, simplistic, um, but it works just fine. Um, so um, we put phosphorescent tape on the side. We, we literally hold the, um, you know, put, put the cage in the light, it charges up. Then we do our experiment, and then um, basically it slowly dims over, you know, over the course of sort of twenty or thirty minutes. Um, but it's um, um, it, it seems not to be, uh, you know, basically the, the intensity of it will dim, but the mice still know that that's the same cue. Uh, and we've, you know, we've sort of, you know, calibrated and sort of measured the you know, how the candela, you know, how the luminance falls off in candela per meter squared um, for, for two different types of phosphorescent tape that we use. Um, so that's one issue. I mean, another issue is the obvious one of head fixation. When we first did this, um, you know, I talked to um, John O'Keefe and um, um, uh, Richard Morris, and they both told me, well, you won't map place cells in, you won't find place cells in animals which are head fixed because the vestibular information is important for forming place, place field. So we said, no, okay, but we'd already started doing it at that point. And as you'll see, we found actually that wasn't true. We could, we could do it. Um, but nevertheless, it's not desirable. Um, you know, we would like to have um, an alternative approach. And um, Guif and Chen um, at UCL actually came up with an approach that does work here. Um, which is to um, have a slightly more complicated system, which has got a commutator so that the mice can actually rotate their head around a, a sort of a fixed location. Um, so they've got that working nicely. And in that they've managed to demonstrate not just place cell maps, but also grid cells as well. Um, we haven't tried looking for grid cells yet. Um, it will be interesting to do it. I'm not sure if we'd find them or not. Um, this system well works well with electrophysiology and with virtual re reality stimulus systems. Um, I think it would be challenging to do this with the way it's sort of set up with two photon. I mean, I'm sure it could be done, you know, but you have to you know, compensate for rotations and all sorts of things. So um, that's not something we wanted to deal with. Um, it's also only a single modality. Um, a key thing about our setup is actually it's, uh, it's those stimuli you saw are visuotactile and the tactile element is, is probably quite important as well. Um, um, we'll see, you know, can we map place cells in 1D and 2D? Um, we'll see the answer to that. Um, one aspect of this is it's a persistent multimodal environment. So it's not, for, we, we sort of emphasize this isn't virtual reality, you know, it's, it's real reality, it's a persistent environment. Um, you know, but our, our mice are vestibularly challenged. Another issue is that the cage is relatively small in, you know, the, um, the diameter is 32 centimeters. Um, the circumference is um, 100 centimeters. So basically, at the most, we've got a 100 centimeter kind of um, you know track that the animals are in, which is probably small for a mouse's behavior. You know, if you, you know, your mice and your house probably you know travel many, many tens of meters in their in their sort of daily explorations. Um, um, so possibly it's on the small side, and if, if we could somehow extend that to a, a bigger system that would be that would be much better um okay now we can use this to get at um aspects of the task so we have multiple um multiple such um carbon fiber cages with different sets of cues on them um the way we structure our experiments we we call one of them fam one okay so that's familiar one okay and the mice always get exposed to that for 20 minutes um, at the start of the session. And we will, we will record from the same field of view over about two weeks, okay? Now, and, and on different days, we might run different experiments, but there's certain, you know, in FAM1, we'll, we'll always be running, okay? So it's the sort of the baseline. Now we might have, and the animals have learned over that behavioral training week, they've learned the FAM1 environment. They've also learned another one, FAM2. Okay, so it's another one which is familiar to them. Now, if we take the take the animals from having twenty minutes in fam one and move them into fam two, this is like a memory recall operation. Okay, so what's happening is the place fields and hippocampus will remap, corresponding to this 
you know, recognition of being in a new spatial environment. So it'll bring up this new, bring up this sort of spatial memory corresponding to the FAM2 environment. So it's a memory recall operation. We can look at memory encoding by instead transitioning to a novel environment that hasn't been seen before. So in that case, um, you know, you can see over, uh, you know, over the first sort of, you know, four to eight minutes or so, you can, you can see the new memories actually being, being laid down. Um, okay, so that's how, we, how we're doing the, the task structure aspect of this. And um, yeah, we, we image, um, you know, we've got a, a red channel and a green channel. Um, we're using um, uh, Kaiman uh, to do the region of interest uh, segmentation. We've um, sort of augmented that pipeline just with a few sort of bells and whistles to, you know, uh, most, mostly, um, mostly addressing the sort of the tracking cells over a, you know, over a period of sort of several weeks uh, sort of aspect. Um, we originally, in the early days, we had our own um, uh, regions of interest uh, identification software, um, ABLE, which I still think is very good. Um, it's just a matter of, sort of having the resources to develop it to the point that the Cayman people have, have done. So, you know, it's like, there's no point, uh, no point um, reinventing the wheel. They've, they've already done that quite well. So we've, we're making use of that. Um, and we typically image... Um, uh, this this example is 300 micron field of view. We're typically doing 500 micron field of view now, and so we're getting you know maybe 300 neurons or so. Um, um, and so sort of here's an example uh, we seeing. Um, I'm just showing you a subset of the neurons here. Um, the magenta trace is actually the the spatial location of the mouse at that point in time around the 100 centimeter circumference, and we can see the sort of continuous time sort of calcium transients here. Um, what we do is we detect the calcium transients, we, um, and now I'm showing a rastogram at the bottom there where we, we turn it into an event trace, but where for each event, we keep the amplitude, okay? So it's the, basically, um, so we, we're marking each event by the time of the onset of the calcium transient um, and um, effectively the height of it. Um, so um, now we could, go further obviously and do um you know really turn it into a spike train uh, but for most of the analyses we want to look at um that doesn't really add very much and we don't you know we could put you know for instance for this big calcium transient you know, we could put say four spikes we might infer there are likely four spikes plus or minus one or something um but we'd be basically you know, making up the timing in effect, right? Um, as to the you know, precise timing of those. So instead, what we've chosen to do is just sort of keep um, keep a record of the amplitude of that, of the relative amplitude of that. And of course, you know, we don't have ground truth, you know, on any of these in hippocampus. I mean, it's um, it's quite hard to get ground truth on hippocampal neurons. And even if we did, you know, it it varies. You know, the relationship between calcium and spiking varies from from cell to cell. So we we prefer not to sort of make those extra assumptions. So instead, we keep these kind of like um, event trains with amplitude um, for many analyses. Um, and then looking at those, um, we can see some examples here where I've turned those into rasters as we, um, we've got the mouse running around the circular track. We've got five example cells here. We're putting a, a, one of these dots down with, with a diameter corresponding to the size of the calcium transient um, when, whenever um, the cell fires. And you can see for each of these cells, you can see very nicely there's a sort of a place field um, as sort of being established here. Um, you can sort of unroll those into a, um, a rastogram and you can see how, how reproducible it is across, um, across loops um, around the, or uh, laps around the track. Um, and um, you see, it, it doesn't necessarily fire each time it passes the same location, but on average, it does something you know, fa you know, you know, um, fairly consistent. Um, there is, uh, for many cells, there's a little bit of drift over time um, it's often in this backward direction. Um, we have been looking at sort of, you know, we have a, there's a student based in Melbourne who's actually sort of exploring that aspect um, further. Um, okay. Um, Simon, I have a question. Yep, sorry. Yep. Yep. Very naive. So, yep. these, you know, for an unrelated paper, we actually had to predict the position from uh, the activity of cells in the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying to predict the position. Yep, of the so mouse, you mean? Of a mouse, of a yep. mouse. Yep. And what we actually found is that, you know, this prediction was heavily dependent on the velocity of the mouse. Yep. So I'm wondering, is it a problem of, you know, and also that deconvolution, as you said, was yep. actually giving very bad results. So yep. we were able to fix the, the convolution problem by smoothing a lot. 
you know, yep. this, okay so, so you'll end up with something similar to what our representation yeah, but, but at yeah. the end you know if it's smooth, yeah. then why did it convolve in the first place yeah so that's some trees that was working very well yeah but then the velocity it was very yeah that, that doesn't surprise me i mean um it is known that many hippocampal neurons are velocity dependent um we haven't systematically mapped it um it, it's one of the things on the on the big to-do list uh, to look at in our data set but um, it has been done by others. So yeah, there is definitely additional information in the velocity. Um, yeah. So I'm not surprised. <laughs> but but the, the, there is a way to, the fact that the mouse is going faster, it means also the, the lags, you know, between when you read. It could con yeah. And so it's, it becomes very complex, right? I yeah, exactly. I mean, in a way we're doing the best job we can with the frame rates. We've got to guess it like, at, locating where that um you know, you know that position in in space that corresponds to the calcium transient but of course if we detected it you know, it, you know but that that's coming from our calcium imaging right and that's not necessarily the best fine time scale thing so for fast for fast running epochs you know, maybe that error is significant um uh it could be that if you deal with that in a nicer way actually some of these place fields would get small would, would contract a bit that's possible um the spatial information may go up a bit yeah um I, the other thing i just wanted to say is a reason for doing for not a reason for not just keeping it in a continuous time series we turn it into an event train uh, um and that's because if you keep it as a continuous time series um then so continuous in time um then um there's a confound because if the mouse is running slower versus faster the calcium transients would be sort of stretched out and you'd basically yeah, yeah. put it. So because we're mapping time onto space when we're doing this place cell mapping stuff. So you don't want to do that. You you definitely need a point process of some kind. It doesn't have to be spikes. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So that's, that's some examples. And then, um, you know, what you can do is you can map these over a population. So this, um, um, this is uh, uh, one um, example here. What we've done is we've sorted that. You, know, you may have seen these plots before. You basically take you know, uh, all of the cells in one imaging um, session, for instance, and um, sort them according to the location of the place field. And you get this kind of um, you know, diagonal line, um, put a bunch more neurons in, and you get a, a more straight diagonal line. Um, um, has to be a little bit careful because if you just took some random data and sorted it according to the location you would see a diagonal line right okay um so um there are a few things to do with that i mean one one thing you can do is cross validate we don't actually do that but instead we have a um basically a bunch of checks on things that have to be to be included in in, in this in this figure um including spatial inf information numbers etc um and and some statistical criterion um if um if you didn't do that, what you would see is the off diagonal bits would be fairly high. Okay. Um, so if, if you were not looking at real place cells, um, but just random stuff, okay, you'd still see a stripe might be, might be one pixel wide, but it would be a stripe. Um, but you'd see high off diagonal things. So basically what you should be looking at is effectively the height of the background there. You know, the background is reasonably low. Um, Okay, so um, the other thing, you know, we looked at a few things like actually where the place fields were, and it turns out they do actually depend upon um, location of the visual cues. So they tend to be in between the visual cues, but at the doors of the cage. Um, so there is some non-uniformity in that. Um, we can look at the field size, and these things, these things are sort of a roughly comparable to what you see from the linear track experiments, um, as are the bits per event. So we measure spatial information as a sort of quantitative criterion I'm going to be a little bit careful about this so we so firstly it's not mutual information it's the skags approximation to the mutual information which is a first order approximation to it um, effectively you think of it as a measure of tuning it doesn't include like if you normally think about mutual information um you would have an effect um of trial to trial robot reliability for instance so you could have two cells, which on average over trials fire at the same amount, but one of them is more variable from trial to trial that would have lower mutual information. Okay, both of those would have the same SCAGS information. Okay, but SCAGS information is the, the measure that's used to compare in the place field community. So that's what we're showing. We do the other as well. Um, 
The other thing is what we're doing is we're calculating because we're not turning it into spike trains, okay? Well, this is the scags information for the calcium transients. So we we actually are doing the, the using the amplitude of them in calculation of, of that information value, um, but um, effectively we're normalizing by the number of events. So it's bits per event, bits per calcium transient, okay? Is, that, is our measure there. Uh, so we've got to be careful not to compare that with when with the exact numbers that you get when people have done that for, electrophysiological data, um, but it turns out actually the numbers aren't very different because the calcium transients ca carry a bit more information because we've got the amplitude in it, but there's less of it because there's multiple spikes in there, but there's less of them. So it actually factors, you know, cancels out. Um, okay, so we can compare place cells and non-place cells. Um, place cells um, um, tend to have more events per second, more calcium transients per second. Um, and we can also look at that in terms of actually the, um, um, the activity. So what we do is we accumulate, so let's say we've got, um, so we've got our event trains with, with amplitude there. The, the units of that amplitude are delta, is delta F on F, okay? Um, we might have say a window of, you know, T seconds it, with which we're sort of accumulating that, that out. So we might say, we count up the delta F on Fs and divide by that time window that gives us an activity measure in delta f's f on f's per second roughly a, comparable to you know the historical firing rate measure okay and that so that's slightly more sensitive measure than um than this event rate um and you know both of these show basically higher um activity rates for place cells than non-place cells um the other thing we can look at is variability from trial to trial Okay, um, so we did get at this question, just not with mutual information here. Um, to do this, we've borrowed something that came from the visual neuroscience literature. Um, so where, where um, there is this sort of classic um, thing from, um, originally from a paper by Tolhurst, Motion and Dean in um, 83 or 81, I think, um, where they present the same stimulus um, sort of you know, many times and look at the variability of the number of spikes um, relative to the mean number of spikes. And they, by varying the stimulus, you can vary that mean. So we do the same thing here, but we do that by, by moving that window around the place, uh, you know, around our, our circular track. So basically we collect the activity each time. Um, so each time the mouse passes this location and that bin goes in there, and we accumulated the, the mean and the variance there. So we can look at that for some examples. We can plot the variability versus the mean um, on log-log um, coordinates. We then sort of fit a, a straight line to it. Um, and um, as was found in the visual neuroscience literature, you know, it's sort of nicely fit by this um, relationship, you know, variance as being proportional to the mean to some power beta, okay? And that power, basically tells you about something sort of intrinsic about the variability of this neuron. This, this is sort of an important thing. Um, um, for a Poisson neuron, it would be one, for instance. Um, so these neurons are more variable than Poisson. Um, and we're doing this in terms of the, the you know, this, this quantity here, which is roughly equivalent to a firing rate like quantity. Um, what we find, interestingly, is that um, the place cells are more reliable, so less variable in terms of this variability exponent beta than our non-place cells. The place cells, so, so um, the, the place cells actually, I don't have, somewhere in these slides maybe maybe is the, num the fraction of place cells versus non-place cells, but you know, uh, probably most of them are place cells, maybe 60%, um, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, and um, uh, you can kind of see that from the, from the histogram, um, the place cells are more reliable. Um, okay. Uh, we haven't done anything on this yet, but actually that variability exponent might be a very interesting thing to look at in terms of circuit changes um, due to um, neurodegenerative disease conditions, for instance, um, particularly in view of the aberrant excitability hypothesis, which is one thing you might think might disturb such a sort of an intrinsic variability, um, in vivo in vari variability, um, coefficient of a neuron. Um, so that was, so we saw place fields in this circular track, which is sort of, you know, roughly, roughly sort of a linear type environment. And um, what about in the open field? Um, we were a lot less clear we were going to get them in the open field, um, but we did. And in fact, um, I, you know, if, if you really push me, I, I would say, I don't think they're probably quite as good quality as 
in freely moving animals. Um, actually, quantitatively, the quantitative measures don't show that. that that's more just sort of gut intuition, having looked at you know, also some of the data from David Dupre's uh, um, lab. Um, but we, we, we do see um, place, place fields um, in, open, in the open field um, um, with field sizes, which are roughly comparable to what's seen in um, uh, freely moving animals. Um, bit rates, which are better than what's seen in virtual reality, but not as good as, not quite as good as what's seen in freely moving animals, though not far off actually, um, et cetera. Um, Another thing we're able to look at is remapping. Okay, so if you take the animal, as I've sort of mentioned this before, you take the animal from one environment, move it into another, the place fields remap. Well, actually, not all of them. Some place, some, yeah, some cells may stay in the same location. Um, most cells will actually tend to remap. Um, and you might have some cells that completely lose um, um, their place sensitivity, and other cells which previously weren't firing at all might start firing with place fields. Okay, that's the reason for these. The numbers of cells here being different on these different plots, we'll see in a minute. Um, so what we can do is we can we can take um, take the, the place cells recorded in one environment. Um, we can order them according to their place field location in that one environment. We can move the animal into a different environment, um, and look at the activity of all of those cells, but sort them according to locations in the first environment. Um, now you can see from you know from the stripes there actually these cells did have place fields, but they just you know they were remapped. They were not ordered. You know, they are ordered in a completely different way. Um, so, uh, you know, there is no sort of stripe there. Um, we can then control that by basically um, instead, you know, resort them uh, based upon uh, based upon their place field in environment B, and you see you get this nice stripe back, basically. So, so um, you know, they did have place fields, but they had just shifted. Um, there seems to be no systematic um, basis for the shift effectively you know you're, you're rolling the dice again um the cell is just as likely to fire to a you know a completely you know, random location in in space um okay and this up at the top you can just see some examples of individual cells remapping um now that doesn't just occur transferring animals from one environment to another but also if you take them back into the same environment at a much later point in time. Um, so if you take them back in the same session, you should expect actually they have a strong correlation with their previous place field. Um, you go back the next day, um, it's there, but actually there's some degree of shifting and over, over a time scale of days, it tends to shift. Um, it shifts you know, more than we initially expected it to, although actually when you look in the literature, everyone is seeing this um, over roughly the same time scale. Uh, you know, maybe measuring it in slightly different ways. Um, so basically, um, um, yeah, the, effectively the, the thing to take from this is um, that over a, over a time scale of multiple days, you get, um, you, you get, a, you get a, sh a fairly significant sort of shift in the place fields. Um, you know, despite that, the animals remember how to do the task. So the information is there in the brain, but uh, you know, they're just you know, instantiating a different hippocampal representation of it. Okay, so far we've we've talked only about um, um, wild type mice. Um, so I now want to move on to the Alzheimer's uh, model. Um, so this um, it's the five X FAD model. It's basically a model um, of early onset Alzheimer's disease. It's got it's an overexpression model that um, has got five um, genetic mutations um, that sort of correspond to sort of human. Um, uh, uh, human patients with familial Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's it, over the past five to seven years or so, it's been one of the most standard Alzheimer models used. It's now sort of transitioning out. Um, that there are some newer models, the knock-in models, as they're called, um, which um, don't overexpress um, 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 amyloid precursor protein, but rather have it in mutated format wild type levels. Um, so those models are a bit better. The 5XFAD model at the ages we use it, we think is pretty good. Um, the animals, there's one particular, um, okay, so the animals show am amyloid plaques, the animals show cognitive um, degradation. There is a recent paper 
finding that they didn't, but we find that they do in accordance with previous literature before that. So I think they do. Um, um, there is one confounding variable is that they're a bit um, hyperactive. I don't mean the neurons, I mean the actual animals. They tend to run around a bit more. And we have found that in fact. Um, so that's potentially a confound and that's something not found in the newer uh, Alzheimer models. Um, that's possibly not true, certainly at the early age group that we're looking at here, maybe to, a, to some extent in the later age group. Um, okay, so what, what do we find when we're looking at this? this at this point now, the previous work um, was all published um, and there's, um, there's in the slides as a reference to the um, frontiers in um, cellular neuroscience paper that that's published in. So the stuff from this bit is not published um, and this is analysis we're working through at the moment. Um, so um, CA1 plays cells um, in the 5 xf mice. Firstly, they show hy hyperactivity. So we did find evidence for hyperactivity. Um, they have wider place fields and less spatial information on average. Um, so looking at these examples, well, it's actually not very obvious looking at the rasters for the indivi for individual examples here, got to look systematically. Um, if you look systematically, so here's the sorted um, place fields. Um, the key thing to look at is the background. You can see that the background is higher here than it is here, okay? Um, that's sort of um, symptomatic of, of basically, you know, hyper elevated neuronal activity outside the place field, which is what really we're seeing in this with this hyperactivity, um, which again lowers the information. So um, now looking at that quantitatively, now we've only done the events per second so far, not the, not the activity rate measure. Um, so this is um, in calcium transients per second. Um, I expect the activity measure to be more sensitive, um, more useful. Um, and there's a significant effect already that basically you have more calcium transients per second um, in 5XFAD mice. Um, um, the place field size tends to be larger. Um, the spatial information um, is lower for 5XFAD mice. Um, and uh, let's not worry about that other one. Um, uh, one thing we didn't find yet is a difference in remapping between um, um, 5XFAD mice and, and their wild type sibling controls. We, we expected to see that, um, we haven't. Um, uh, we'll look at that further. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about mice running around in circles. Okay, so I mentioned we actually want them, we want to get them to tell us something. And um, to do that, we're introducing a working memory task. So for this, this work is done um, um, by- Simon, sorry. No, I'm um, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm curious if, um, so in, in these models, do you see like a, a big difference in the hippocampus in, in your actual images? We start- um, Like structurally? Well, we see the amyloid plaques. Yeah, I mean, so okay. I guess we haven't looked at the sort of the, the synaptic level that you look at, but other people have and other people see that. But yeah. Oh, oh no, yeah. I was curious whether you saw plaques. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, no, we see plaques. We see plaques. Um, we try and we're trying to blind ourselves in that because there's this blinding issue, right? We're blinding ourselves in the analysis, <laughs> but we can't in the experiment because they're they're there. Um, to to map them properly, we do that using the amylo using the methoxy down at um, seven twenty nanometers. But yes, you can even see this stuff in uh, you know in the imaging. Yeah. Are there differences in, in the activity or coding, maybe we'll get to this, uh, or coding properties of, of cells in the vicinity of plaques versus yeah, okay. away? Um, yeah. I don't have the answer to that yet uh, because we're still working through the analysis, um, bringing in the aspect of, you know, taking each, you know, mapping the locations of the, of the plaque and then we're going through and then for each cell body, we're then looking at, um, how far away are the plaques? Um, you know what? You know how, what? How, what distance is the plaque in each direction? And then getting a sort of a quantification for a radius going out from that, so we can then sort of quantify a sort of um, an amyloid load versus distance measure for each neuron, and then see how the functional properties relate to that. So we're looking at exactly that in detail. But um, yeah, there's quite a lot of analysis to go through, so we're, we're still working on that one. Yeah, yeah, that's what I want to see. Um, so, okay, um, this, the, the working memory task uh, work has been done by Yimei Li, um, a PhD student uh, working in collaboration with, with Anne and Siegfried. Um, so um, here we're using a forced alternation spatial working memory task. So um, 
So the alternation tasks are, are fairly simple. You know, the, the mice travels down this central corridor. Um, on one trial, it's got to go, it, maybe it goes left, and then the next trial, it's got to go right. So it's got to remember what it did last time. Um, um, this is, there is a spontaneous alternation version of this task, um, but um, basically I think it's, um, um, the, the forced alternation version is I think a little more sort of hippocampal dependent and uh, more, you know, a bit more of cognitive load. Um, um, they, um, so that, that's what we do. Um, there is a delay period. So it, um, the delay, but the delay period in this version of the task is effectively the time it takes them to run back um, down to this sort of center period again. Um, and that's about 10 seconds. Um, again, when, when you know, we're writing up this stuff, we're gonna sort of quantify exactly the distribution of it. Um, for the next version of experiments, we've got something planned, which is to be able to vary the delay period. We can basically drop a solenoid down um, which freezes the, the carbon fiber cage so the, the mouse can't move for, a, for a, until a fixed elapsed period of time has, has passed and then it's allowed to move again, right? So we can actually have a variable delay period to make it you know, arbitrarily difficult. Um, I mean, it's already, as you'll see, sort of you know, difficult enough for them. Um, I but uh, yeah, yep. How does the running down a track happen with the microscope? Is the microscope moving? Is it? Oh, no, 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 no. The microscope and the mouse or and the mouse's head are all in one place. Okay. Okay. Um, so it, it's still I mean, the... just as before, it's the track that moves. <laughs> right. Wow. Um, I don't have a video of them doing this particular task. We can get one made up, up maybe, but it's okay. the same as what you saw before, except in, <laughs> rather than just going around in circles, you know, they explore this um, sort of figure eight, eight ish like pattern. Right. Um, yep. Um, okay. So um, now act, in practice, what we're doing now is we actually run the same mice on both tasks. Okay. So we first we first run them on the place on the circular track, and then they move on to the uh, working memory task, which is quite nice. But uh, um, um, so basically, um, yeah, we're doing um, GCAMP seven S. Um, um, that have they have um, ten days of behavioral training on this particular task and practice. They're now coming into it from the other task. Um, um, wasn't true initially. And then the other stuff is sort of as, as before. Um, we do this in vivo methoxy XO4 mapping. Um, we'll see in a minute, at the end of this series of experiments, we actually kill the mice. We, we, um, we kill the mice and we do a whole brain um, ex vivo um, two photon tomography on the brain. So we can look at uh, amyloid across all of the brain. Um, I'll get to that in a minute. Um, okay, so firstly, um, the 5X FAD mice reassuringly do show deficits in working memory. Um, this is the young mice, so they're two to four months old, but they are still um, having amyloid plaques, okay? Um, so the wild types are in blue. So over, this is over 10 days, because it's two sessions per day. Um, they basically, about halfway through, they start, um, you know, they're improving, they start improving performance, and they get up to sort of saturating performance, uh, you know, after sort of um, 16 or 17 sessions there. Um, we, we consider 70% to be sort of um, a criterion performance. Um, um, and the, uh, and, um, the five X FAD mice, uh, basically don't improve, um, very much. So they struggle doing this task. Um, um, and that's also true for, for older mice. We also look at seven to nine month old mice where basically there's a lot more amyloid in the brain. Um, that, you know, this, um, this is actually early. This is probably one of the earliest cognitive deficits actually that's been found in this in this mouse model. They're normally talking more about five to six months. So that's actually quite interesting. Um, um, at seven to nine months, um, well, the main difference you can see here is that the wild types don't, don't learn it quite as well either. So, so the, the older wild type mice are, are maybe also um, a bit slower at sort of learning it. They do eventually get up there, but it takes them a bit longer. Um, and... Um, yeah, overall, um, yeah, we have a criterion and um, basically some fraction of the mice um, you know, don't reach that criterion. And that um, um, fraction, of course, is, um, well, so the, the fraction, some fraction do meet the criterion and that is low, a lower fraction for the, um, um, the 5X FAD mice. Um, um, yeah, okay, that, so the criterion is 70%. You can see there's error bars 
um, they're indicating that a few of them are actually sort of coming up a bit. Yeah. Um, okay, what about the physiology? Okay, firstly, um, oops, um, the CA, CA1 neurons are, are hyperactive in 5XFAD mice. Um, so, so far we've just done the event rate measure. We haven't done the activity measure, which will be significantly more sensitive, I think, in this, because one of the things you tend to see in this is not just hyperactivity, but hypersynchrony and things. So, you know, we've probably got a, a you know, a clustering of action potentials together in a you know, slightly more bursty fashion. Um, um, so, so the more activity-based measures are actually going to um, pull that out more sensitively. Um, and we do see basically, you know, it is you know, statistically significantly higher. We've got, of course, you know, you know thousands of cells in here, um, uh, higher event rates for the um, Alzheimer mice than the non-Alzheimer mice. Um, um, now, this is a sort of very preliminary analysis here, um, and maybe it's overly strongly worded, but basically place cell, you know, where is this coming from? So the place cells are actually hyperactive only in animals which are showing working memory deficits. So we can look at all of the animals down here and we see, you know, roughly what we saw before, but actually if we pull out in this old Alzheimer group, okay, and the blue is the same between here and here, but the red here is just the the old 5XFAD mice um, that don't reach 70% performance in the last three sessions. Okay, so this is the animals that didn't, that couldn't do this task. Um, and those ones have significantly higher um, hyperactivity. So, uh, significantly higher activity. So, this is all sort of lending itself towards the view that um, uh, aberrant excitability is, you know, in intrinsically related on an animal by animal basis uh, to the ability to do the working memory task. Yeah, so to cognitive degradation. Okay, and then finally, sort of as um, um, as Casper sort of mentioned, yes, we, we go back and look at this stuff in vivo. We can relate the individual cells to the locations of the amyloid plaques. And so here's some examples extracted from the in vivo imaging there. Um, but, um, we're, we're still taking it the, to the next step and relating these back to the actual physiological um, data, which, which will allow us to go not just animal by animal, but cell by cell, which will start to be uh, you know, quite interesting, I think. And then finally, I want to move away from in vivo um, to, um, to dead, dead mice. Okay, so at the end of these experiments, we, we kill the mice, um, we fix the brains, and then we do um, tissue site um, serial two photon tomography. So, so tissue site, it's it's only the same system that the Allen Institute used to be using. I don't know, Casper, um, are they still are they still got tissue site systems in um, um, in their pipeline, or is it now now old hat? I, yes, but not much longer. Oh, really? Okay, all right. Well, um, it, it costs three fifty thousand pounds, so we're not going to replace ours in a <laughs> in a while, and uh, it, it's. A valuable part, part of our, our pipeline and to be honest there's still a lot we can do um just on the on the analysis side sort of you know you know add integrating things in um as you'll see what we want to do is really try and incorporate this so we can actually track you know physiology behavior and you know whole brain ex vivo um histology in the same animals and sort of map it all together and so the way this works is um basically it's a two photo microscope um you um, you, you take the brain, um, you basically do a fairly standard, maybe just, you know, just um, slightly stiffer uh, PFA um, embedding protocol, um, a pr protocol embedded. Um, you, um, you then put it under the, um, under the microscope. There's a, uh, an automated microtome. It, it will image, um, say, 50 micron, 100 micron um, um, thick section um, with two photon. Um, uh, tile that across the different areas. You slice that off, image in the next one, etc. Um, one little augmentation we made to this is to cool the bath. Basically, um, it turns out that you know imaging over, you know, this it takes about three days to image your brain. Um, uh, that heats the heats that bath up, um, and actually you get a lot of mush sort of stuff to uh, you know uh, appear in the bath. Um, by cooling it, actually the slices float to the bottom. Um, and actually, the other thing we can do with that is we can take those slices out and then use them for immunohistochemistry. Um, and we'll see an example from that in the next slide, in fact. Um, 
So, okay, this, this is sort of what it looks like on one of these brains. So this is, a, this is one of the mice that went through working memory task. Um, um, so you see that on the whole brain, we've got six different slices through there. So we get the 3D, I'm just showing you slices through that. Um, in gray is a, um, a background image um, formed from autofluorescence. And then the other channel is, uh, we can see in red here is the methoxy, um, corresponding to amyloid plaque locations. Um, uh, you can also see some, some <laughs> sort of big dents in here. Don't forget th this animal had this um, aspiration, you know, for our imaging window and, and, and that does affect things. But actually that doesn't matter because we can still map it onto the Allen mouse brain database and um, you're quite fine and, and you're outside of the very immediate vicinity of that sort of, you map that very nicely onto, onto region locations. Um, and we can Im we image in you know the whole brain um, the the amyloid and then we've done we've taken those slices out and done um, um, thioflavin so it's a, basically an, an, um, another immunohistochemical approach uh, to sort of validate that approach um, and uh, what we find is that the hippocampal formation and the thalamus show the highest plaque densities um, um, and you can already start in these young mice you can start to see that. Um, you know, plaques coming out in hippocampal formation and thalamus in the 5XFAD mice, two to four months old. Um, and then by the time you get, you get to the old mice, you've got this sort of, you know, broad spread of amyloid across, you know, many brain areas. Um, um, and then the final thing is we now, what we're doing now is relating that back to the behavior. And we've just got, this is just a very preliminary slide where we've taken two of those areas um, and we can relate it back to both Okay, in this case, it isn't really the left side, it isn't really behavior, it's actually the average spatial information for the place fields recorded in the um, in the circular track task. And then we're relating that to um, the amyloid um, density, plaque density in, in this case, it's just the two of those regions, um, hippocampus, hippocampal formation and um, thalamus. Um, and on the right hand side, um, we're doing that with the alternation percentage of the last three trials, um, uh, last three sessions rather, um, for, for the working memory tasks. We can relate sort of all the way through. Um, um, now, I'm just really showing that for illustration here. What we're actually working on is a statistical model where we take basically, uh, you know, effectively a vector of um, amyloid um, plaque density in each area. Now, this is actually just number of plaques where adding into the pipeline also size of the plaques, okay, which is, you know, again, a more sensitive measure. Um, and then basically, okay, there you've got a matrix of, you know, of mice by area, you know, brain areas with the elements being, being the um, uh, plaque uh, measure. And then on the other, the other variable being, you know, either spatial information or, um, or various aspects of the memory task. And then we're, we're we're developing a statistical model to sort of relate these. Um, um, now it, it's obviously challenging because we're going to have relatively small amounts of data because it's you know down to numbers of mice basically. Um, but um, the anyway, preliminary indication is that this, this is, is doable. So yeah, I'd like to end there, I guess, with a summary. Um, so the summary is that basically we've been using this Neurotar floating cage system um, for mapping place cells in 1D and 2D and, and doing um, you know, cognitive behavioral tasks and we've sort of validated this at this point. Um, we've sort of developed a whole pipeline where we're sort of able to do the behavior, um, image calcium signals, and then sort of relate it all, all together, applied to both spatial memory, um, spatial working memory tasks. Um, um, we're able to sort of re observe recall of old and formation of new spatial memories, um, tracking the same neurons over several weeks. Um, um, relating this to performance in cognitive tasks, such as, um, and then combining it with ex vivo two photon tomography um, so that we can, we can do in vivo neurophysiology, um, um, behavior and whole brain histology and track that all the way through in the same mouse. Um, so I'd like to, I guess, sort of thank a, a bunch of the people involved in it. I've highlighted some of them along the way. Uh, Steve Brickley's another professor at Imperials and a collaborator on the tissue site imaging. Um, and this, you know, this is sort of a wider group who've been involved in this, in the work in my lab in general over the past uh, um, few years. Um, this work was funded mostly by a philanthropic donation from Mrs. Ann Nuren um, and, and um, um, various other 
um, funds in the lab. Um, I'd like to finally end just by mentioning we've got two postdoctoral positions open um, that I'm recruiting for at the moment. Um, the ad is about to come out. Um, these um, are both to do experiments with large field of view in vivo two photon imaging. Um, think, think Spencer's um, diesel 2P, although there's some uh, limiting factor with the lens uh, at the moment, but, but something like that, um, but aimed at, um, uh, so this is a project aimed at detecting neuronal avalanches and sort of related phenomena across sort of large brain areas. Um, so we're looking for one postdoc with a sort of an optics type background and another um, with in vivo neuro neuroscience and, and data analysis backgrounds. So if, if you're on the market for postdoc, uh, do come and talk to me. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll leave it on that slide. Uh, so thank you for your attention. <laughs>